Don't you love our kids? Come on, give our kids team an awesome hands. Come on, can you show some love today? Awesome. And, uh, you know, it's always funny when the kids check themselves out on the screen. My first service, my boys were uh, the whole time during the song just turn around. And my, one of my favorite parts uh, with the kids singing is the part that they actually know, where it's the shout, shout part. Come on, you know that. I got that one down. Hey, uh, I just got to tell you, as the kids are, are heading out, I am so grateful um, for our incredible kids team and uh, all of the hard work that they put in week in and week out. I know that we are super, super blessed. And I do uh, want us to just thank uh, our team of uh, ministry team for kids ministers, lots of moving parts in kids ministry. Can we just show all of our leadership team some love? Just come on, not just today, but the investment in your kid's life. Come on, you can do better than that. Just let them know how much you appreciate them. And uh, so grateful. So, so grateful for our entire team. Welcome to week two of our series entitled King of Kings. And uh, we are looking at a passage from the book of Isaiah. If you have your Bibles, you can open it up to Isaiah chapter nine, verse six is where we're at uh, during the series. And we've been uh, just looking at this simple verse today uh, in the last, last week. And then we'll also on Christmas Eve, we'll be looking at it. Here's what it says. It says, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. You know, Isaiah was writing nearly 800 years prior to the birth of Christ, foretelling the character of Christ. Now, when we look at this passage, it's easy to know now and see all that has transpired. But 800 years before Jesus came, it was a tumultuous time in history as the Assyrians were taking droves of people into slavery, droves of people into captivity. And there was this lack of hope and there was this frustration. There was this uncertainty to what was happening. In fact, when Isaiah prophesied and told the people of God this, this would have been a blast of peace and hope to their lives because what they were seeing in the natural, what they were seeing happen around them wasn't necessarily filled with hope. And I don't know about you, but as I look around our world today, I believe that more than ever before, people need the peace of God. People need the hope of Jesus. They need the wonderful counselor. They need the everlasting God. They need God to move in their lives. And and, and, and when we look at this passage, my hope is to encourage you that this Christmas season, that Jesus is who he says he is, that he's done what he's promised to do, and that he still is the King of Kings. And that's what we're celebrating. That's what we were were talking about last week as we started the, the series. We talked about how the peace of God is available to you and I, how he is the Prince of Peace. But a lot of times we put our hope and our peace in other things that really can't sustain us. But God's truth is that if something doesn't give us our peace, if something didn't give us our peace, it can't take our peace. We often blame circumstances. We blame situations on the fact that we've lost our peace. But when your life is built on the promise of Jesus, yeah, your, your feelings come and go, but the same thing, the, the, the consistency of God, the peace of God can reign in your life, whatever you face. Today, we're gonna continue on and, and, and talk about Uh, he is our wonderful counselor. And I wanna share a message entitled, Help, These People Are Driving Me Crazy. Does anybody have a person in your life that just drives you crazy? Some of y'all are lying in church. We're gonna do a whole sermon on lying. We all have people in our life that rub us just a a wrong way. Uh, uh, long, uh, sorry, I'm, words are difficult this morning in the 10.30. I'll get there. During this holiday season, the reality is, is that th- this magnifies our issues all the more. We struggle sometimes because we all have that person. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a neighbor. Or maybe it's a sibling or a parent that just rubs us in a weird way. Like you get around them and they just do something to your spirit and, and, and your heart and your mind, you're like, man, I, <laughs> I, I don't like you. 
You ever felt like that before? No, y'all are too Christian for that. I think sometimes when we get in the holidays, it brings the crazy out of all of us sometimes unnecessarily. And we find ourselves really wanting to escape. Gio, I think he's backstage. Gio, can you come help me, my man? I, Gio is uh, my brother-in-law and also uh, one of our drummers that plays He's in the Fish Tank every week. Uh, and come on, yeah, where, there's Gio. <laughs> Show him some love. My man's got some chops on the drums, if you didn't know. Uh, and uh, really grateful for you. So you know the drill. I got some handcuffs. You ever, are you ever in, in situations in the holiday season where you just really want to go crawl in a hole? No? Let me put it this way. Have you ever found yourself sitting in the bathroom just trying to get a moment? And, and oftentimes in our lives, we just want to escape. We just want to like a moment to like process because somebody's, somebody's a little wacky and saying stuff. Instead of blowing off, you just try to escape. But the hard part about the holidays is that often we can't escape because there's really either, man, you got some big old wrists, but man, that's how you play the drums. <laughs> And uh, you, you get stuck. You ever feel like you want to get away from somebody, but they just follow you? You're going to have to help me preach for a little bit. I didn't bring the keys up here. <laughs> Gio just said in his voice, I don't know if I can, man. <laughs> Or you got to do the motions with me at least, all right? Just a gesture. You ever try to get away from people that are driving you crazy before and it just feels like they're all up in your business? Maybe you've ever been around the conversational juggernaut. You know what a juggernaut is? Someone who's just a big force to be reckoned with. They're, they're a destroyer. They're, they're going to be able to take you out. And, and a conversational juggernaut typically enters the scene when it's all peaceful. Just talking about, man, it's been a great year. I'm so thankful to be together as a family. Yeah, look what I did this year. <laughs> I was driving on the yacht. I was in my yacht. I used to live in my shack, babe. That's when we lived in the shack. In your head, you're thinking, wasn't that a 3,000 square foot house in a really nice neighborhood? Or the one upper that just talks over the top of everybody louder. Not just like talk of this volume. You're talking, it's like, oh, 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 la, la. anybody else have that in your life? Come on, you got the conversational juggernaut. Maybe, maybe it's not the conversational juggernaut, but it's the control freak. Take this, uh, the handcuffs and they just tell you where to be, how long to be there, what to do. And I'm not talking about Christmas plans, please. That's not what I'm talking about. But I just, you know what I'm saying when I say control freak. It's the person, come on, Gio. It's the person, it's the person that quite honestly, they're kind of cray. And they handcuff you on stage. Oh, come on, that's a good one. If you didn't hear, they said the crazy control freak that handcuffs you on stage. I, uh, Gio and I have a great friendship and, and, and I pray it continues that way. He's my brother. It's kind of hurting. <laughs> but control freaks oftentimes will tell you what to do, when to do it, how long to stay there. And if you don't do it, then they'll correct you. Or perhaps they correct the whole group instead of talking directly to you. Has anybody that ever happened to you before? Like, instead of, I'm like, I'm a man, speak to me. Like, tell, tell me. Don't tell a whole group. Or quite, quite possibly, you're not, you're not dealing with somebody that drives you crazy. That's a, that's a juggernaut, conversational juggernaut or a control freak. Maybe, just maybe it's the unaware mess maker. I'm not talking about spilling drinks. I'm talking about spilling your business. Hey, remember when you fill in the blank? No, I don't want to remember that anymore. Remember when you're in your first marriage? No, I don't want to talk about my ex. Come on, like I I should clarify, I've only been married one time. <laughs> but I'm talking hypothetically. 
hypothetically, they're just spilling the unaware mess maker and you feel like you just want to escape, but you really can't. And oftentimes we feel like I'm never going to get out of this. And Gio, you're about to preach a 25 minute sermon with me. No, I wouldn't do that to you. But listen to me, please. In all seriousness, I think a lot of times we want to escape those situations, go crawl in a hole or in a cave or just get away. But can I tell you that God can give you a grace to deal with crazy people? That God can give you a grace to bring freedom. Bro, you got some big old thick wrists. You got, God can give you, I owe you one, dude. I owe you a steak. Come on, look at that. I did that to that man's wrist. I really, I think I do owe him a steak though because I, I didn't realize how bad that hurt his skin. It's soft. <laughs> Just kidding. But please hear me in all seriousness that God can give you a grace to deal with the crazy people in your life. When we talk about God being the wonderful counselor, he is, he is the wonderful counselor. And I know some of you are thinking very unchristian thoughts right now. They're like, yeah, they're gonna need counseling after I'm done with them. And you could do that in all seriousness. That's how a lot of people respond. They'll just, because I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. I'm going to show them what, what's right. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backhand them with my words. And maybe not physical response, but you roll their, your eyes every time they say something. And you're annoyed. And you think that you're going to get the upper hand. But the truth is, is that God wants to guide you into a new way of living. God wants to give you a grace to deal with difficult people. And I want to encourage you, just like Isaiah encouraged the people of God in a difficult situation, that, that, that God is an incomp incomprehensible God, that he is wonderful in every single way, that he is a God that, that, that can contrast the crazy and he brings peace and grace into situations that don't, that don't have peace. And, and Jesus, the Messiah, will cause us to be full of wonders. What wonder, when we, when we talk about him being the king of kings, he brings peace and wonder into situations that are broken and dark and dreary. And he is the one he enters in the situation. He brings a full a full perspective shift and change. And, and, and the word wonderful is much weightier than the word wonderful that we use in our regular life. Uh, Papa Charles Morgan's grandfather used to say after every single meal, every meal without, a, without fail, except for there was one meal where he didn't say this and it wasn't a good scene, but every single meal he said, that was wonderful. <sighs> he just said, wonderful, this is a wonderful meal. We say that when it, it was a wonderful evening. It was a wonderful date. It was a wonderful trip. But can I tell you that Jesus kind of wonderful is all sorts of different than what we think about wonderful. His wonderful was shown while he was here on earth. Think about this. In Matthew chapter one, he was conceived in the womb of a virgin. That's wonderful, incomprehensible. Matthew chapter four, he showed his, his wonderful power by the ability to heal. He was wonderful in his teaching. We see this in Mark chapter one. In Hebrews chapter four, it tells us about his perfect life. I don't know about you, but there is no one else perfect on this earth that's ever set foot on this earth besides Jesus. And if that doesn't do enough for you, you see that he was resurrected from the dead. Jesus kind of wonderful is different, but we've oftentimes thinking, oh, that's wonderful. But Jesus, Jesus in his wonder is the one that heals the sick and sets the captive free. He's the one that speaks a word and brings life back to bodies. He's the one that, that causes dead things to come back to life. That's what Jesus does. That's who he is. And he's a different kind of wonderful. He's a different kind of wonderful because in all that Jesus does and all that he has done and what he's continuing to do in our lives today, can I tell you that Jesus is more than able to give you a place, to give you wisdom where, where, where people are driving you crazy. Jesus is more than able to guide you to a place of wisdom. Jesus is more than able to guide you to a place of wisdom in your life. I think a lot of times we want things to be uh, fix very quickly. You know, for speed and things to be uh, fixed very quickly, uh, it's often expensive. You pay a price, right? We, we lived in a microwave culture where everything happens faster, 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 faster. My goodness, they microwave your burgers and you're happy with it. 
We, we live in a culture where, we, where we, we just go faster and faster and faster. And the reality is, is that sometimes God wants to lead us to a place of wisdom. And sometimes that takes time and patience. How do we get that wisdom? How, how do we find that wisdom? James chapter one, verse five says this. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. And he gives it generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Listen, when we ask God for wisdom, he's gonna give it to us. But I have to tell you and prepare you for the fact that when you stop and pray and ask God for his wisdom, it might surprise you because his thought process is very, very different than our thought process. Him guiding us to his wonderful counsel may look different than what you've anticipated because God sees things differently than we do. His thought process is often counterintuitive to the human mind. Oftentimes counterintuitive, so different. I want you to think about when you read scripture, Jesus modeled and taught and did so many wonderful things that were so counterintuitive to our human nature that would go against the grain. Things are counterintuitive. Think about this. Matthew chapter five, verse four. Blessed are those who mourn. Counterintuitive. Matthew chapter five, rejoice and be glad in persecution. Are you kidding me? I don't know about you, but that's counterintuitive to the kind of life that I think I would naturally have. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. I think our world needs a little dose of that. That's countercultural. That's counterintuitive. Jesus kind of wonderful is, is awe-inspiring and superior to any other kind, and, but yet he is perfect in every way. You gotta understand this, that he is the wonderful counselor, and just because you don't think it doesn't mean that he can't do it. Just because you can't think it does not mean that he can't do it. But when you pray and ask God to do it, you better brace yourself because God's kind of wisdom is different than your kind of wisdom. See, in ancient Israel, a counselor was portrayed as a wise king, such as Solomon, giving guidance to the people. Isaiah used this word again in chapter 28, verse 29, to describe the Lord. He says that the Lord is the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. I don't know about you, but when I was starting out in, in my career in life and ministry, I just wanted to be around people a lot smarter than me. Why? Because when I got around people, when I exposed, exposed myself in situations, the reality was is that I gleaned and learned and got better from them. And can I tell you, when you lean into God's wisdom, you'll get better. You'll get stronger. You'll, you'll approach situations differently. And he's able to give advice because he is qualified in ways that no human counselor is. And I am an advocate for counseling. Listen to me. Some, some people need to process. Many people need to process things. But can I tell you that God in his counsel offers things that no human counselor can give you. Because he is the king of kings. There is no one like him and no one comes close to him. And his wisdom is often counterintuitive to the way that we think the way that we process and the way that we perceive people. So I wanna give you three questions today, three questions to process because we got people in our lives that are honestly difficult. And a lot of times our response to them is visible. It's an air about us. It's not even necessarily what we say, but how we say it. You ever told that to your kids before? Not what you're saying, but how we say it. Can I tell you that people around you, they can feel every bit of that. And so I wanna ask three counterintuitive questions, three, three questions that may challenge you. The first question is this. 
is that have you prayed for the person as much as you've complained about the person? Have you prayed for them? No, 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 I'm not talking about like, Lord, strike them down, cut their head off. Really? It's your uncle. <laughs> but have you, have you really prayed for them as much as you've gossiped about them? Well, I just got to express myself. Well, find a person to express yourself to. Not everybody needs to know about everything. The more you mature, the more you realize that your problems don't need to be everybody else's problems. Have you begun to pray for the people as much as you've gossiped or complained about them? Well, you don't know how annoying they are. I might, I've met a lot of annoying people. <laughs> no, but I'm all seriousness. Our first instinct when we're frustrated with people is to write them off in reality what if we begin to pray for them and really genuinely ask God for his wisdom? Because you can't complain your way out of a problem, but you can pray your way out of a problem. You can't complain your way for them to get better. I've never seen a person grow and God changed their life because com people complained about them but I have seen people change the trajectory of their life because someone prayed for them. And our job oftentimes is to understand that God has placed them there in our lives for a purpose. So have you prayed for them as much as you've complained about them? Second question is this, are you secure enough in who you are that you can tolerate the crazy in your life and give mercy in return? Are you secure enough in who you are that you can give life and mercy and grace to the people around you? Being confident in who I am and who we are in Christ is vitally important to the level of life that you'll live and the level of enjoyment that you have. A lot of people we live, I don't know about you, my thought is we live in a very insecure culture to where we don't even, we're, we're worried about, I mean, the younger people, how many likes or views or who watched or who commented. Maybe it's, some of you, it's based on your, your confidence level and your security is based on how much you make or where you live. Maybe quite possibly your, your friend group gives you your value. But can I tell you, none of those things will hold you up like Jesus can. And you've got to come to a place and be secure in who you are so that God can bring healing to your relationships. Because if you're looking for someone else to give you your security, that's why when, when people are dating all the time, they're, people date in the church and that's fine. But oftentimes when we're talking to younger people about dating, we often talk to them more about the relationship with Jesus than they do the other person. Because if you're looking for fulfillment and joy in another person, they're gonna disappoint you. And nobody can give you what Jesus can give you. So you gotta be secure in who you are, but we live in an insecure person. How do, I, how, do I become insecure? how do I become secure in who I am so that I can give mercy and grace? It's that I'm in the word of God and know, I know who I am in Christ. I'm the head, I'm not the tail. I'm a, I am a son, you are a son or a daughter of God. The, the presence of God, the very presence of God goes before you every place that you go. That he will never leave you nor forsake you. Come on, that's who you are in Christ. 
Does anybody believe that today? I mean, you, you got to think about this, that I, I, God, I know who I am. Listen, and all of us have stages that we stand on in life. It may not be on a stage on a Sunday morning, but it may be in your office. It may be in your workplace. It may be in a classroom. It may be in a presentation. It may be on the stock market. I don't know where your platform is, but I do know that you don't get your significance and your security by your platform. You get it by knowing who Jesus is. You will never find security if you're waiting for this in your life. When that goes away, your security goes away. But when you're built on the promises of Jesus, when your life is built on the word of God, nothing in your life can take your security away. You gotta understand that, yeah, it might make life a little bit easier, your job, it may, your income affects what you can do and where you can vacation, but I can promise you, no one in their life, when they lay on their deathbed, wishes go, and goes, you know what? I just wish I wouldn't have known Jesus. Never have I ever heard that before. Never in my life where people go, you know what, my income changed my life. No. I have seen people saying, I wish I would have loved my family. I wish I would have worked to resolve those things. I wish I would have, but can I tell you that Jesus can make all things new and you don't need to wait till then. In your life, whatever's in your spirit will flow out of you. So when you're secure in who you are, whatever is in your heart will eventually come out of your mouth. You ever, I don't know if you've, this has ever happened to you before, but has anybody ever said this statement? I don't know where that, they say something like mean or brash or really nasty. And you're like, I don't know where that came from. Can I tell you that whatever is in you will eventually come out of you? And we all say dumb things at times. And we should have a grace for ourselves as well. But the reality is, is that if it comes out of you all the time, there might be something that is sick on the inside. And as we process our security, we've got to understand that people are going to be, people are going to be mean sometimes. My dad said it this way. He said, some people are idiots. You're a pastor. You can't say that. I just did. And he taught me this phrase. He said, some will like me, some won't like me. Who cares? Who cares? Because reality is that there are some really mean, dumb people in this world. But are you secure enough in who you are in Christ that you can tolerate and give grace in return? I tell our staff this way, you gotta have thick skin in this life, but a very soft heart. You gotta let things roll sometimes. What does that mean this Christmas season? you might have to use some self-control and not say all that you want to say. I'm being serious. You might need to bite your tongue or control your body response because even though they didn't give you what you deserve doesn't mean that you need to lash back out at them. What is grace? Grace is something that they don't deserve. Think about this. In our own lives, God gave us a grace that we didn't deserve. Scripture says that while we were still, what sinners, Christ died for us. What is that? That is grace, my friend. That's grace. And if we can't, well, they don't deserve grace. You don't know what they said to me. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they look at me. No, I don't know how they look at you. Might, might, you might have made that up in your mind. You know, they, they don't deserve it. They, they don't They don't. They, that's not, no, no, what you're saying is that if they don't deserve it, they, what you're essentially saying is you're better than Jesus. So that if you're unwilling to give a grace and a mercy in people in your own life, you're saying you're better than Christ himself. Because Christ gave us grace and mercy when we didn't deserve it. And I'm so thankful for that. So this begs the third question, is what if God brought them into your life so that he could change their life? What if God brought that person into your life so that he could change your life? As the team's coming, I just want you to think about this. What if God brought them into your life to elevate their spirit 
And it's not about an arrogance. It's not about being better than other people. I think sometimes we think that if we're, we're Christian, we're automatically, come on, can I just tell you, we've all fallen short of God's standards. We all need the grace of God in our lives. What we're saying is whatever's in our heart, whatever we receive, we'll eventually give to other people. And if, and if God is in our lives, what if God brought that hard person, that hard-hearted person, that snappy person, the person that just rubs you wrong or says the things that just, you think, man, what is wrong with you? What if God brought them in to your life so that they could actually see the grace and mercy of Jesus for the first time in their entire life? What if? What if that were the case? What if God wanted you to share his peace and wisdom? And it's, it's not so that people could see your wisdom and see your greatness. It's so that they could see God's goodness in their lives so that they can see God's greatness because he is the king of kings. And just like you need peace, can I tell you that they also need peace. And just like you need counsel, they need counsel. And just like they need miracles in their life, you need miracles in your life. Can I tell you that God wants to do it in your life? But oftentimes, we feel as though God doesn't care about my situation. God doesn't see what I've gone through. And when God sent his only son, Jesus, down to this earth, it wasn't for humanity minus you. <laughs> A lot of times we feel like our situation, our challenges are so difficult or so isolated that it's God cares about everybody else but me. You know what that is? That is a lie from the enemy. God absolutely, without a doubt, cares about you. How could God ever help me? Why don't you just ask him and see what he does? Maybe he just gives you a patience Maybe the situation doesn't even change, but you just have patience. What if God resolves the relationships? What if God brings you to a place of restoration for your parents for the first time in 25 years? Maybe for the first time you can look somebody in the eyes and not just automatically wanna chop their head off because the peace of God. You know the difficult part is that some of you, you think you've been holding people accountable to how they've treated you. And the reality is the person that's been held captive is you. They might have even moved on and not even realize, and you're the one that's cuffed to the pain still. You know what, today God wants to bring healing and freedom to your life. Because God doesn't want us to live a life to where we can't enjoy it or where we don't know what to do. God wants to bring you to a place of peace and wholeness in your relationships. As you stand to your feet this morning, and I just want us to take a moment to reflect and to pray together. Lights are going to come down just so you're not distracted. And in this moment, I even want to ask that you would bow your head and close your eyes because I just feel like this is such a private moment between you and the Lord. And, and I would ask that you would be honest today. I wonder, I wonder how many that are here and even watching online today, you, um, you have that person in your life or that relationship in your life. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a, a coworker, maybe it's a family friend that just, you've just been clashing and you've got unresolved things going on in your relationship. I wonder, I wonder if you would surrender that to God today. 
If that's you this morning, would you just raise your hand and say, you know what, that's me. I, I, man, I just got a relationship in my life that I need God's help with. Come on, anybody this morning, would you raise your hand high? Come on. If that's you today, say, you know what, I got, I need, I need God's help. And, and I want you to raise your second hand just as a sign of surrender. Come on. Would you just like, you're going to give it to God today. God, I'm going to give you this in this moment. And, and I'm going to surrender this, this problem, this relationship to you. And God, I really need your help. And I want you to right now just begin to say, God, I need your help. I give you this situation and I ask that you would resolve something inside of me and that you would begin to do what only you can do, or that you would give me wisdom. Come on, let's just begin to pray and ask God for his strength. Father, we thank you. We surrender these, these tensions that we feel. God, we surrender these relationships. Come on, if your hands aren't raised, would you pray? Come on, would you just pray for people around you by name? God, we just pray right now that you would do only what you can do. And Father, we ask that you would bring a peace in our hearts and our spirit this Christmas season. God, as we see people and as we go into homes and as we sit at tables, Lord, I pray that you, you would bring peace, God. I pray that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, God, would become cemented into our hearts and our spirit, God. We resign and resolve the fact that we can't control everything, that we can't fix everything, but we know that you can. And God, we're, we're going to choose to no longer be held captive by what happened, but God, we're going to surrender ourselves and our ways to you. And we ask, oh God, that you would do it in our lives this morning. Now here's a, a, sh a, a shift and a change is I want you to begin to pray for that person by name right now. And, I'd, and, and not that you would just belittle them, but that God would move in their life, that they would find the fullness of joy in Jesus, that you would have unity, that you would be brought together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for every person that is on these, that are on their minds today. God, I pray for their salvation today, oh God, if they don't know you. Lord, we ask today that the peace of God would move and reign in their lives. Jesus, I pray that there, where there is brokenness, that there would be wholeness today, God. Where there is anger, that there would be restoration, oh God. And we declare that, that, that you are all that they need, God. And we thank you for giving us a grace and a peace to care for people, that you're leading us, God. But when we encounter them, God, I pray that the presence of God, that the mercy of God, that the grace of God would overflow from our hearts and our minds, God. Every comment, Lord. God, rather than being sharp and, and despiteful, Lord, I I pray that you would give us a tone that is pleasing to you, God, instead of an eye roll or a shake of a head. God, I pray that you would give us an assurance, and Lord, that you would give us a strength to respond and a, and with dignity and respect. And God, I pray that the very presence of God would move in and in through us. And today we ask, God, that you would move. God, let, let you be magnified in us. God, let, let your presence be flowing from us today, Jesus. We declare this. Come on, we declare. Come on, let you be magnified, Lord. Jesus. Come on, let's, let's just make this our prayer. Let's make this our prayer today. Come on, look you, Lord. We want you to flow through us, to be seen in and through us, oh God. We need you today. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Lord.
if that's your desire today, can you put you just put your hands together? God, we thank you. God, we thank you for all, for you flowing out of us. Lord, we pray that the word of God and the hope of Jesus would flow from our actions, our facial expressions, and our tone. God, I pray that this Christmas season that you would give us a grace to deal with difficult people. And God, we thank you that you are always, always with us every season of our lives. We thank you for the fulfillment of the promise that you are the King of Kings. In Jesus' name, everybody who believes it, say amen. Amen. Hey, can I tell you two quick things before you go today? One is um, we have our Christmas Eve services on Saturday. I would ask, man, we've, we've been preparing and praying. Our team's put hundreds of hours into preparation. I wanna ask you that you would pray with us, that people would come here this Christmas Eve and, uh, and that they would hear the hope of Jesus and make decisions to follow Him. And if you're here in town, we would love to have you for one of our three services. Also, I wanna share uh, with you that we're gonna be giving an update on the totals for Waymaker uh, in the coming weeks. However, I can tell you that it's amazing. You've already surpassed what we did last year. Come on, isn't it amazing? God, so good. Thank you for your generosity. If you haven't been able to participate and you, and you want to participate, you missed last week, you can give today. It wasn't a one-time thing. If you wanna participate, you're more than welcome. But I cannot wait to see you on Christmas Eve. We're gonna celebrate. We're gonna have a lot of fun. And I truly believe with everything within me that the best is still yet to come. We'll see you on Saturday. God bless.